First of all, does anybody have any questions? Yes? Do we have class tomorrow on Thursday? Yeah. Yes, I'll be here. I mean, I'll be here. You don't have to. Go. Well, you don't have to come any day, really, right? But I'll be here to answer any questions you have. I'm not going to do any lecture. Like, I'm not bringing any examples. But what I did post is I posted. So in the final, I, there's a new folder called Final Exam, and there are now two things in there. Some people have found them already. Uh, the first one in there is the one, it says 146 takehome.pdf. That's the take home portion. And you got to bring it back to you to class. You mean you didn't print it off for us this uh, time? I did not print it off for you this time. <laughs> no. Yeah, you, you'll have to print it yourself. <laughs> well, you can, do it for free in, you can do it for free in the tutor center. Because it's only eight pages. And since it's only eight pages, they'll let you do it for free. And you have, yeah, you also have a quota as a student. Yeah, what, 250, 350 pages or something like that over the course of the whole class? Whatever that. Yeah, man. Yeah, let's try to be a little more positive, man. Anyways, uh, no, I didn't print a copy. So you can go grab yourself. So, um, anyways, there it is. So take that home and do that. It's still a little long, but it's doable. How many lessons? Um, I think I got it down to 45. <laughs> and it only goes, it doesn't cover the entire breadth of the course. It only goes up to like probability and counting. Yeah, you forgot yeah. to include the answer key. So, the so I know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the rest of the final is going to be done tomorrow. So then what I also posted um, was I posted a practice test for the final which looks a little different, uh, but this is how I'm going to format the actual exam, okay? So what I'm going to basically do is I'm going to give you like a case study that covers the last few sections of the course. So um, in this particular case study, they're talking about testing the calibration of a machine. So they want to try to see if the, uh, um, oh, what the heck? I have a typo here. Oh, great. Ah! Don't print it off yet. <laughs> Otherwise, this isn't going to make any sense. This is supposed to be 60 grams. I don't know how 43 got in there. Yeah, it's, well, I, I'm in protect. It wouldn't matter. I had to add it. Actually, yeah, what I'll do is, um, where are you in it? There we go. I'm going to change it right now and update it. But, um, so what the idea is, there's this manager. He wants to, um, he wants to test whether or not his cow, his machine is working. So it's supposed to be producing elbows at 60 grams. Obviously, it's important whether they're too light or too heavy. If they're too light, they might not be as strong as they're supposed to be. If they're too heavy, then they're probably wasting materials. So what he does is he goes out and he samples 12 of the PVC elbows or the fittings and measures their mass. And then um, what I want you to do is uh, calculate a mean and standard deviation. That came from way back in Chapter 3. We should be pretty good at that by now. Um, and then I want to do some hypothesis test stuff. So, you know, state a hypothesis, figure out what type one and type two errors are based on that pick an alpha level. So there is no right or wrong answer on the alpha level. It's your choice, but you have to explain why you picked it. Um, should be based on which error you'd rather commit. Then I want you to do a confidence interval, a hypothesis test, approximate a p-value, and then give me a nice good interpretation about what you would do as a, the manager, okay? Right, <laughs> but you got a while to work. But this, so this is the practice test, and the actual, the stuff I want you to do in class will be similar to this. I want you to do an actual. I want you to do an actual test from scratch. Yeah. Question. So, okay. So you're gonna give us the practice, practice exam what you showed us before. Yeah. And we'll take it home today. Yeah, it's already so up there. Online and then print it up and yeah. Get that finished. Uh, you don't have to. Um, Right. And then in class, when we come, we're just doing this part of the exam. That's right. Yeah. And we can have two pages of notes. Sure. Mm -hmm. You can bring a page of notes. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right.
They have to be handwritten, though. All right. For the final, uh, I want you to bring in, uh, bring handwritten notes. Like handwritten notes? Yeah. <laughs> handwritten. All right. So, any questions? Yeah, so the first document is the one you're actually going to bring back and turn in. The second document is just something for your own practice to prepare for the final. All right. Cool. And that's what, so that's what you should expect on the actual next Tuesday when you come in, in class. Yeah. Um, okay, so is all that going to be counted? Is the take home portion going to be counted less than that in class portion? Or are all the questions the same, worth the same amount? Um, I, uh, they won't be worth the same amount. Um, the, did I, I can't remember actually if I put that on the syllabus at all. What is that? This is my addendum. I can't remember if I listed that out. I usually do do some portion of it take home. Bum, 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 bum. Did I specify final exam? Uh, no, I didn't specify on there. Normally what I do is I just split it like 50-50. So 50% of your grade will come from what you take home, and 50% of your grade will come from what you do in class. Yeah, I didn't specify on that. But overall, it counts to 25% of your grade. Yeah. All right, any other questions? All right, am I recording? Yep, cool. So um, yesterday, we were just doing the very last, uh, we were Discussing the hypothesis test. So what example did we end on? We were looking at, uh, I got off on a tangent. Oh, here we go. We were looking at um, the effects of alcohol um, on adolescents, and they were looking at how it affected the volume of, hip, of their hippocampus. So this was a two-sided test um, where we just wanted to know whether or not the truth was something more or less, or either way. Yeah? And so uh, we set up our hypothesis test. We use the t-test instead because we're talking about a mean here. And so we use our sample standard deviation, calculate our statistic. In this case, our statistic was way, way out there. So way outside in the rejection region. And um, we also looked at the p-value. So with t-tests, you can't get exact p-values. P -values. The best you can do is approximate them. And, um, but either way, it comes up with the same results. I also mentioned, though, that anytime you're doing a two-sided test, the other possibility is, um, is to construct a confidence interval because it's two-tailed. Yeah. And so in this particular case, we could use a t-interval. So we could construct the, uh, the t-interval using the formula. So it's being alpha. Okay. Like that. And then all we have to do is check to see if the null hypothesis is in the interval. So this is the way we can use a confidence interval to do a two-sided test. You make the interval and then see if the null hypothesis is there. If the null hypothesis is in the interval, then it seems reasonable, so we should keep it. If the null hypothesis is not in the interval, then we should toss it out. Reject that. Okay. So uh, in this particular case, we had, uh, what was our, our X bar was uh, for our particular teens. So we had a sample of 12 teens, and they had a sample mean of 8.10 cubic centimeters, and a standard deviation of 0 0.7. So 8.10, standard deviation of 0 0.7. Our sample size was 12. Uh, we actually already found the T alpha over 2. So since we were doing this at uh, the 1% level, we split our, al our alpha over 2 would be T sub point zero zero five with 11 degrees of freedom. And, um, right, because our degrees of freedom were 12 minus 1 equals 11. So we actually went to our T table and already got this value. Um, that's how we got our cutoffs, actually, remember? We went to the table with T sub point zero zero five, three point one zero six. This is the reason, this is actually the reason that a two-sided test can be done with a confidence interval, because that T value on your interval is going to be the exact same as the T value on your uh, 
cut off for your critical region. You're going to use the same value. So if you go to the table, look up T.005 with 11 degrees of freedom, that's going to get you uh, 3.106. Okay, so we're going to use that same multiplier. And now we're just going to uh, calculate our interval. So we're going to take our mean, 8.10, plus or minus, our T value is 3.106, times 0 0.7 over the square root of 12. And so, uh, so somebody with a calculator, what do you get for that margin of error right here? Let's see if we can get an answer here that we agree on. Lesson one, I'm not sure. What do you get? You can take it. Six two seven. Zero point six two seven. Okay. No. Yes. No. I'm getting a couple people getting that. Yeah. You get something different. Six two eight. Six two eight. Six two seven six. Yeah. It could be. Did you did you do it all in one step or did you do it in a couple steps? Just one step. Six two eight. Six two seven. Okay, either way, I'm just going to round to 0 0.63. So that makes everybody happy because that means we all agree. So and plus our original measurement's only two decimal places anyway, so I'll just keep that. So if you, if you go here, now we actually calculate that interval. So go from 8.10 down 0 0.63, that'll take you down to what, 7.47? Or is it 5.7? 7.47? And uh, up to, what, 8.73? All right. So then basically that tells us, so for our confidence interval, our confidence interval goes down to 7.47, up to 8.73, right? Our 8.10 was in the middle. And we're saying that with a 99% confidence here, that we think the true mean is somewhere in this range. But what was the null hypothesis? The null hypothesis was 9.03, right? This is mu zero. That was the null hypothesis. Is that hypothesis in our interval? According to our interval, does that seem like a reasonable value for the truth? No, it doesn't. Our interval is entirely below the claim. So it's basically saying, you know, this doesn't really seem reasonable. So since the, so mu zero is not in the confidence interval, then that means that we should reject the null hypothesis. Okay. Does this match our decision with the other two approaches? Yeah. So it's critical value, we rejected. P-value, we've still rejected. Confidence interval, we've still rejected. So if you do it right, hopefully they all give you the same decision. So there's different approaches. Um, Personally, I think the inner confidence interval is the easiest way, but that's just me personally. I don't know. Maybe they're all the same, basically. The p-value is probably the most complicated, but p-value has significance. All right, um, and so what does that mean practically? We already made this decision yesterday, but what are we actually saying here about alcohol and the hippocampus? Yeah. It appears that alcohol does have an effect or does not? Does, yeah. According to this, it would appear that alcohol does have an effect on the size of the hippocampus. All right. Questions on this interval or the test in general? No? Okay. So you can only, again, you can only use the confidence interval for a two tailed. So I have one more example we'll go through so you can feel really comfortable doing these t tests. So, um, so FICO is like the federal insurers of credit, or I don't know what it means, but anyways, they monitor credit scores basically. Okay, so um, FICO scores on average in America are 703.5, according to them. 
the actual administration. Important to FICO. Alright, so overall, for everybody who has a credit score through FICO, which is pretty much everybody, all right, um, the average credit score is 703.5. Uh, so what a researcher wanted to do is they wanted to test whether or not um, households that make more money have better credit scores. You think they might, but you never really know. It's possible, maybe not. Okay. So they want to test if, uh, if you look at households that earn, say, more than $100,000 a year, Have above average FICO scores. Okay. So this researcher suspects it may be true, but you shouldn't really make a decision until you've actually done a sample and have some data to support that. So in this particular case, uh, what would be the formal hypothesis, like uh, H0, H1? What would our H0? Mm -hmm. We're talking about a mean or a proportion? M or, is it a mu or a P? Yeah, it's a mean, average. Okay, so we're talking about mu here. Yeah, the null is always equals, and so it should be equals what? Yeah. So going into the test, we'll just assume that they have the same average score as everybody else, but we're thinking we can potentially show what? Yeah, perhaps maybe there, it's something greater than that. All right. So, um, what's our what's our steps here? What's the first What's the first thing we could do here? Okay, so we could go straight to our test statistic and then take that test statistic to get a what? Somebody said it, because before I heard it. Yeah, you could do the test statistic to a p-value, so that's one approach. Uh, so we could go with a p-value approach first, and then see if our critical value works the same way. So if we wanted to go to the p-value approach, that's right, you go straight to the t-statistic. So it's going to be um, x bar minus the mean over s over root n. Oh, except for I didn't tell you the sample, right? So the researcher goes out, okay, let me split this up over here. So the researcher goes out and uh, samples, where am I at, 40 households that earn over $100,000 a year. And uh, from those 40 households, the researcher finds they have a sample uh, mean credit score of 714.2, uh, but a standard deviation of 83.2. So pretty variable. So credit scores, I think, can go up to a maximum of 850, I believe. Um, but just because you have, just because you make a lot of money, doesn't necessarily mean you have a good credit score, right? Because maybe you have a lot of debt, maybe you missed a few payments over time or something. So, um, so here we go. So these were the results. Um, so what do you say here? So to calculate your T statistic, in our sample. We had a sample mean of 714.2. The null hypothesis is a 703.5. The uh, standard deviation was 83.2, but we sampled 40 people. So it's going to scale that back a little bit. Okay. And uh, if you do that, what do you get for your uh, T value? Let's stay rounded to three decimal places. 0 0.813. 0 0.813? Anybody else get that? Yeah. 0.813? I got two people at 0 0.813. Anybody else get something different? Another one? I got three people at 0 0.813. All right. So this is our test statistic. Well, first off, just based on the size of that test statistic, do you think we're going to reject this or not? 
Does that seem like a very big test statistic? Less than one? That's a pretty small test statistic. Um, normally, like I said, if you see test statistics like above three or four, you're definitely rejecting because that's way far out there. Uh, this T value is not very big, so my guess is we're probably going to fail to reject. But we should go get a P value on that anyways. So how do we go get the actual P value? So we're going to take our test statistic, 0 0.813, was that right? All right, and then um, what's our degrees of freedom on, on this test? Yeah, so our degrees of freedom is one less than the sample size, which is 39. So we need to pull out our T table. <laughs> which I do not have up, so it's going to take me a sec. So here we go. So we're looking at um, 39 degrees of freedom is down here. And our T statistic is in this range, right? So you say, you, I'm down here at the bottom at 39 degrees of freedom. So our T statistic is between 0 0.681 and 0 0.851, right? So I'm going to write that down. And the reason why is we're going to use that for our T value. So since our T statistic is between, what was the bounds, um, 0.681 and 0.851, I think was the other one. Yeah, right here. Then that means our p-value is going to be bounded by, you scroll up to the top of the column, that means our p-value is going to be between these two numbers, 0 0.2 and 0 0.25. So that means our p-value is between 0 0.2 and 0 0.25. All right. So again, you take your t-value with your degrees of freedom to the t-table, and you see where your t-value falls. If it falls between two numbers, then you know that your p-value is going to be between these two areas right here. Right. And uh, do we need to double this p-value or not? Yes, no, maybe so. I don't think so, why not? Remember it was a one-sided hypothesis, so our p-value is just going to be this area. The area above, because it's one-sided, so we don't have to double it. And so we don't know exactly what that area is, but it's definitely between 20 and 25%. Um, does it really matter what alpha level we're testing at here? No, this is way big alpha. So, so even, even if we were to choose to test this, uh, let's say that we chose to test this at even, say, the alpha 0 0.10 level, so even allowing a pretty high alpha level, are we going to reject this or fail to reject it? That's right, because see, our p-value is bigger than our alpha level, and p-values that are big mean fail to reject. So what are we actually what are we actually saying here? What are, what decision are we actually making about the credit scores of households that make more than a hundred thousand dollars? Are we saying they are above average or they don't appear to be above average? Yeah, it appears, there, at least we don't have enough evidence that these households have above average scores. So even though in our sample, uh, you know, the, our sample was slightly above average, they had an average credit score of 714 as opposed to the overall average of 703. The variability was really high and it was a small sample. And so we can't really necessarily extrapolate that to the whole population. So at this point, as far as we know, it looks like 
Maybe it's a little higher, but we're not really comfortable saying that for sure. So we'll just assume that they're average. Yeah? All right. Questions about this example? Is the p-value the only way we could have done it? No, not necessarily. Um, we could have taken a critical value approach and probably hopefully reached the same uh, results. So let's say we wanted to do this as a critical value. Okay. So say uh, with a critical value, our first step is to, whoa, is to go get the cutoff. So we are, let's say our alpha level was 0 0.10. So we need to go get the t value where 10% uh, is above, right? And our degrees of freedom here is what? What was it, 39? Because we sampled 40 people. Okay, so basically we're going and looking for t sub 0.10 because that's our alpha level and we're one side of test so we don't have to divide in half with 39 degrees of freedom. So if we uh, check out our table, 39 degrees of free, so t to 10, t to 0.10 is the fourth column. Scroll down to 39 degrees of freedom, and you'll get 1.304. Uh, Everybody see that? Okay. So that's going to be our cutoff. So that's 1.304. So that's our cutoff, and up here is our rejection region, right? But what was our T statistic? We already calculated it. Wasn't it only like 0 0.813? That was our T statistic from the last part? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So your test statistic doesn't change, it's the same. And so we can see from our picture here, you know, 0.813, is that in the rejection region? No, so that's not in the rejection region. Uh, we we actually calculated it. It's if you plug in. Yeah. Stop it. Ah. My computer's making me angry. Let me draw that. It doesn't want me to draw that. It wants me to hit buttons. But it was that from the from here, back in the first one. So it's like with the p-value approach, you just calculate it up front and take it to the table. With the critical value approach, you go get the critical value, then you calculate it. But we don't need to calculate it twice because we already did it. So it's not in the rejection region. So again, what should your decision be? Well, if it's not in the rejection region, you probably should not. Yeah. So again, we would still come to the same conclusion. Like that. All right. Any questions? No? Everybody feel semi comfortable with that? Doing a t test? Yeah. All right. Can't really use a confidence interval here because it's a two side. It's a one sided test. All right. Cool. That's all I actually have. Unless you just really want to do some more t tests. But. Any questions from the homework? Questions about this? Yeah. Okay. All right, so I'm done with the lecture, but if you want to stick around, Juan had a question from the homework, so we'll take a look at that. Mm. Juan, did you email me a while back? And I never got back to you or something? I did get back to you? Okay, I couldn't remember if I got back to you. Number 19. I just had a question before I left. Um, mm -hmm. I talked to you a while back regarding the activities and how they never got graded. You mm -hmm. told me to resubmit them. Mm -hmm. And I did that, but they still didn't get graded, so I resubmitted them. Are you putting them on my map on? Yeah. Yeah, just send me an email and say, hey, I put them on there. Can you send me an email? Yeah, I'll do that today. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. You ready to take a look at this? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Part two, okay. So I'm just going to read it. And because we got to fill out the first few parts anyway. So they uh, say that a score 20 on the math portion suggests they're college ready. So to achieve this, the company recommends they take a core curriculum and math courses. 
They randomly select 200 students who completed those. Um, and a mean math score of 20.5 on the college entrance exam with a standard deviation of 3.3. Do these suggest that students who complete that are actually college ready? That is, does it look like they are scoring on average above 20 on the math portion of the exam? Okay. So here I think our null hypothesis would be that the mean is equal to 20. And we're hoping to show that for our students, the mean um, exceeds 20. Yeah? OK. All right. Uh, verify the requirements to perform the test using the t-distribution satisfied. So the students are uh, randomly sampled. In this case, uh, there's more than 30 people. Um, test scores are independent of one another, we assume, I guess. So yeah, fine. All right, so now we need to go get our test statistics. So use the classical approach at the alpha equals 0 0.05 level. Um, find the critical value. All right. So let's see. So this is identify. So when they say test statistic, that means they're looking for the actual statistic. Um, I don't think they're looking for the critical value right here. Okay. So your test statistic, that's going to be this uh, sample mean. Right. So our, so let me pull this up here. That's not what I wanted to do. So here our uh, X bar was 20.5 and our standard deviation was 3.3. And our sample size was like 200 something, wasn't it? 200. Yeah. All right. So then our T statistic and this, the claimed mean was uh, 20, right? That's your sample mean. So we need to do 20.5 minus 20 all over 3.3 over the square root of 20. Okay. So try that. Let's see what we get. So I'm going to try it. I'll just do an Excel because I got this right here. So that's going to be uh, 20.5 minus 20 divided by uh, what was it, 3.3? Yep. Divided by the square root of 200. Okay, so my test statistic is 2.142748. And um, they want to round that to uh, two decimals. So that would be 2.14. Okay. Does that help? Was that the part you didn't, you weren't getting? This part. Okay. So identify the critical value and correct the, select the correct choice. So remember, so this is a one, since this is a one sided test, so our alternative here is that mu is greater than mu naught. To get our cutoff, we're going to load all of our alpha level up here. We're not going to split it in half. So um, since our alpha level for this particular problem was. What they want to do it at? Did they say? Was it the point? Oh, yeah, point oh five. So since our alpha level here is point zero five, we're going to put that point zero five all up top. So we're going to be going to look for t sub point zero five, and our degrees of freedom are going to be one hundred and ninety nine because we've tested two hundred people. Okay. So uh, we'll go to our table, and we're going to look up t sub point. Um, what is it? T sub point zero five with um, two hundred degrees of freedom. So typically, when we don't have one, we just we just pick the one that's closest here to two hundred. So you don't really want to go higher. You always want to go. You usually, you definitely don't want to go up to a thousand. So since 200 is closer to 100, I would pick probably this one right here. So it's T sub point 0.05 with, we'll go with 100 degree of freedom. Oh, actually, they gave us a table, though, didn't they? Let me make sure. Let me check their table. Because right here at the top, they gave us a table. Okay, theirs looks the same. 
So we're going to go with this one right here, uh, 1.66, I think. So it's, uh, so it's a T alpha. We're not splitting it in half because it's a one-sided test. And it was, uh, was it 1.66 something? Was it three sixes? Zero. Six six. Yeah, there you go. Zero. Oh, round of two decimal places anyways. It's 1.66. Okay. Yeah. All right. So then at that point, it looks like ours is bigger than that. Right? So that was our cutoff. And our test statistic is bigger than that. It sits out here. Uh, and so it looks like that's big enough, so we should reject. So we reject the null hypothesis. There is sufficient evidence to conclude that the population is greater than 20.